Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, our lunchtime webinar on Inquests, a guide to the essentials. Um, I'm Emily Formby, and I'm joined today by Caroline Allen and Scarlett Milligan, and we're going to talk to you uh, for about an hour um, on Inquests. Um, we've also got, um, thanks to Caroline and Scarlett, some fantastically detailed slides, which uh, hopefully are a pocket guide to everything you might wish to know. Um, and we will make that available to you after the webinar. And what we thought we'd focus on in the next hour is picking out some of the best bits or sort of the most interesting bits for discussion uh, and let you read all of the detail in your own time. So that's the rough outline of what we're going to do. We've also got a question and answer box open. So if anything occurs to you as we're going along, please pop in a question. We may not get to it uh, in the course of the next hour, but we will always answer them by email later. Uh, so for those of you that don't know us or our inquest practice, all of us represent both claimants and defendants in the inquest field. Um, well, in all fields, but in particular inquests today. Um, and uh, so we, we know what it's like representing both uh, families that are bereaved and also um, individuals and institutions who are uh, being called into question in relation to um, the deaths. Um, I particularly practice in um, personal injury and clinical negligence. And so I've done lots of inquests over the years, ranging from deaths in custody, Ministry of Defence inquests, to all other things, healthcare, um, uh, shopping centres, um, you name it. If, if uh, road traffic accidents, um, there it goes. I've, I've been involved. Um, Scarlett has a mixture of a PI and public um, um, inquest and inquiry practice. So um, she's particularly lending the public um, interest to us today. Um, and in particular, instructions for Article 2, where the state has had an involvement, uh, feeding into that sort of public and, and private intersection of practice. Uh, whereas Caroline has an expertise, again, general PI, but in particular um, with inquests in relation to healthcare. Uh, and so for her, the Article 2 is very often in that sort of family sphere, looking at what has happened. Um, and she's going to uh, give us some of that healthcare setting, hospital, psychiatric unit element. Um, so hopefully a rich soup of um, experience and issues that will answer all of your questions or possibly raise some more. Um, and as I say, we're going to talk to the slides, um, but enough from me. So let's uh, move on to the first slide of our talk. Caroline, do you want to tell us about the underpinning? legislation of the coroner's rules. Of course, thank you. Um, I won't go through all of the, uh, the, the legislation that's set out there, not least because it would be rather tedious. Um, broadly speaking, the most important and the most relevant are the Coroner's and Justice Act, which, which is the main underpinning statute, and the coroner's inquest rules um, 2013. In respect of both the, the act, the rules and, and, the, 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 and the regulations, I think what's worth noting is that the coroner covers a, a very wide field in respect of their professional obligations and duties, their statutory obligations. And so there will be much within the act, the rules, the regulations, which is not in fact particularly relevant in, in, even in the sphere of inquests. Um, I would also draw your attention in particular to the Chief Coroner's Guidance, Advice and Law Sheets, because I think these are really helpful. Um, they're very useful summaries of the applicable law, the applicable rules, and they also give a real insight into the coronial duties and the sort of balancing exercise that a coroner is likely to be carrying out or, or should be carrying out when making the decisions in, in, in the course of an inquest and the matters preliminary to it. Um, it's not mentioned there, and of course, it's not actually doesn't actually form part of the coroner's rules. But there is also Jervis, which is Jervis on coroners, which is very much the sort of comprehensive guide to coronial law. And if you have a particular issue um, arising in, in in the course of an inquest or, or, or prior to it, Jervis is the one that we turn to. And so just picking up from those rules, um, we can see that it's the, the obligation for deciding whether an investigation, um, let alone an inquest, takes place um, is, is that of the coroner. Scarlett, is that an obligation the coroner's alone? Very much so. So that's set out in the, 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 four, the first four elements um, of the 2009 Act for setting out coroner's duties to, to hold investigations. Um, but... Those decisions can be reviewed, which is something we'll, we'll pick up on towards the end of the talk. Um, and it's also worth bearing in mind that an investigation doesn't 
equate to an inquest. So typically an inquest will follow an investigation, um, but the investigation can be discontinued by the coroner where the cause of death is, is becomes clear before an inquest and there's no need to, to hold an inquest. So all the deaths are reported to the coroner, the coroner sifts through and decides uh, what should go forward, um, which brings us neatly on to the question of scope um, and what that inquisitorial um, uh, regime will look like. So Caroline, could you explain that for us? Of course. Um, we have the, the, the four matters to be ascertained, um, who, who the deceased was, when, where and how they came by their death. And of course, we'll all be very familiar with those. And then there's the broadening of the scope in the context of Article 2 inquests to how and in what circumstances the deceased came by their death. I have to say, um, my personal experience is that it doesn't really have too great an impact in terms of how the inquest tends to proceed and the evidence that is heard. Um, whether it is the broader scope that applies or, or, or the narrower scope. Um, certainly, I've found that most coroners are, are usually fairly happy, actually, to allow a pretty considerable degree of leeway um, and, and, and to permit exploration of the surrounding circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I've had lots of coroners describe it as a sort of wide funnel. And mm. so they'll have a wide scope and, and let lots of things be looked into. Uh, but as you get down to the nitty gritty of what types of decisions may be left either to the coroner or the jury or whoever's going to be filling the format toward the end, uh, then that kind of funnel becomes much narrower and the, 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 the focus lasers in a bit more. Um, is, that, is that your your feeling as well? Very much. It does seem to crystallise towards the end. Yeah. yeah. OK. And so you've mentioned there a couple of things. There's the Article 2 and the Convention Rights, um, and that's the Convention of the Human Rights Act. And that's been unaffected by Brexit um, thus far. Um, and also prevention of future deaths, which both of which we'll go into um, later on in the talk. Um, so the first thing really one has to think about is um, who the interested parties are. So when the coroner is carrying out their investigation, there are people that have an interested party um, status. Now, of this rather dense slide, um, do you want to pick out some bits for Scarlett that you think we should focus on? Yes, so we've already done a sort of sifting of the uh, legislative categories. We've only picked out a couple there, there for you. The list is longer, but typically family members, uh, those who may be somehow implicated in the death, uh, and anyone else as the catch-all provision um, that the coroner thinks has a, a sufficient interest. And is that a once and for all decision? No, so at an early stage of the inquest, a, a coroner will typically designate parties as interested persons, but that's not, the door isn't shut. Uh, the PIR, and indeed at any other stage, if the evidence develops and your client thinks, well, actually, I, I think we really need to be involved, an application can be put forward at any time. Um, and that's just helpful to always bear in mind what role do you want to play in the inquest because an interested party designation is really a gateway to active participation in the inquest. And it gives you access to the disclosure and the witnesses and the ability to ask questions and so forth that we'll come on to in a minute, doesn't it? And also, as you were saying, that you can think about the inquest and then other roles. So, for example, a sort of JR or, or a later claim. Is that what you're sort of referring to, Scarlett? Yes. Yeah, so keeping an eye out on the broader landscape of, of where this the death and the inquest proceedings fit in to, to your client's interest, best interests. And can I... Sorry, sorry I, just, I was going to say, yeah, sorry, yeah. There's, um, there, there is an additional tactical element to it, I think. Um, if, if you would, it, it may be that your client would prefer to maintain a lower profile, that there aren't any particular questions that they think they might like to put to other interested persons, that, that they think that actually their, their involvement is fairly tangential. So, of, of course, just as you can apply to the coroner to, to, to seek interested person status, um, you, you can also say, look, I, I don't actually feel that our organisation or I as an individual and, 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 and have a sufficient interest. And actually, I'm perfectly happy to attend as a witness, but, but I don't really want the sort of level of potential scrutiny um, mm. and, and potential publicity, of course, if the press are to be involved. And that, that is a delicate balancing exercise, I think. Yeah. So keep your head below the parapet or put mm. it above and have some greater access to information. And in particular, I think looking at this slide and your healthcare hat, Caroline, um, there's also that particular issue that medical practitioners have to consider and their relation to their governing bodies. Yes, that's right. And, and, and very often for medical practitioners, what one of the worst potential outcomes is, is that you are referred at, at the end of an inquest 
um, to, to your particular regulatory body. And very often that's, that's a concern that's very much at the sort of forefront of, of practitioners' minds. Um, and if they are participating under sort of sub, sub paragraph F, which is a person who may have caused or contributed to the death, then inevitably there, there is, I think, presentationally perhaps that much greater a risk that there may be a referral at the culmination of an inquest or certainly a greater degree of concern. Now, of course, there will be individuals um, who, who have been so involved in the circumstances of the death that it must be under sub paragraph F that they, are, that, that they gain their interest in person status. But there will also, of course, be medical practitioners, perhaps some senior practitioners um, who, who were not directly involved, mm. but who nevertheless wish to be an interested person and, and wish to have that level of engagement and involvement. And that, yeah. that, I think, is something to think about at an early stage. And also feeding into whether there's a requirement to self-refer yourself mm -hmm. to the governing body and, and get ahead of the curve, so to speak, and, and, and yeah. Um, yeah. push and, off and, and... potential criticism. Absolutely. And I, I, I think if, if, if there is any degree of ambiguity, it's always better to self-refer, yeah. because then, you know, if, if, if you are looking at the list of potential sort of criticisms and ch charges against you, then failure to self-refer is, is, is not going to be one of them. So whilst it's, it, it's a very difficult step, and of course, it's, it, it's, one, it's difficult advice to give, um, nevertheless, I would personally, I, I, I would always advise erring on the side of caution and self-referring if, if you think there's a risk you may be referred either by the coroner or, or by the family. Right. Yeah. No, I, 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 I can see that. Well, if we move on from having got your interested parties and uh, up and running, the first sort of hearing that you have or the first engagement that um, we're often involved in is the pre-inquest review. So, Caroline, do you want to sort of carry on a bit and tell us about the pre-inquest review? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that there's sometimes a bit of a tendency to, to overfocus on the administrative elements of, of the, um, the pre-inquest review hearing um, and, and not to look so much at the strategic importance of the hearing, which, which I think is a mistake because the hearings are critical. And obviously, as they're detailed on the slide, the, the issues that are likely to be considered at the pre-inquest review hearing. And, and of course, a measure of it is simply administrative. It deals with the disclosure of documents, the timings, the witnesses, that sort of thing. And it is, of course, the first matter in which the parties are, are before the coroner. Now, this used to be conventionally in the court in which the inquest would be heard. Nowadays, it's, it it's, seems to be more likely to be online, but, but there's no seems to be no particular rhyme or reason to that. Mm. Um, it may be that you have a preference or, or that your client has a preference or that the family wishes to appear before the coroner. And or simply course, resources quite often yeah, as well. <laughs> yes. Resources um, are, are, are often a very significant consideration, yeah, particularly yeah. With, with, with the coroner's office. Yeah, but, uh, but, but I think these hearings are, 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 are critical. The next slide um, turns to some of the strategic considerations yeah, um, I was that, gonna... that come into play. Well, let me pop that one up because, of course, there's the sort of two sides of it, really. One, which is the practical thing, as you were sort of saying about, you know, do you have papers? Do you have a list of people? Do you know, you know, you've you've got a client who's been asked to attend. Are they an interested party or should they be a witness? Um, and then there's also the tactical um, elements that perhaps you can take us through as well, Caroline. Yes, um, I mean, you should have access to an agenda two weeks beforehand. Um, I have to say that this is often something of a luxury. Um, the coroner's offices are very often woefully understaffed and under very considerable pressure. But if you haven't received an agenda, then, then, then chase for one because it helps the hearing to be effective and it helps active participation no end. It also flags up the coroner's thinking at an early stage. What witnesses are they looking to call? What evidence and disclosure do they think may be important? And if you hold particular, your client holds particularly strong views, then the pre-inquest review hearing, or, or ideally even beforehand, um, is, is the opportunity to, to, to sort of set out your stall in that respect. I mean, I um, would say really often, actually, the coroner is desperate for one of the interested parties to say, I'll produce an agenda yes. or um, I will do the legwork. And um, and it's not necessarily, sometimes it's the family, sometimes it's the healthcare body or the institution, um, but often it's the person who just puts their hand up. Um, so if you have a client that you know is very strongly involved on whichever, you know, on whichever side or whatever inclination it may be, I think quite an interesting tactic is to consider whether you wish to make yourself that person, because there's actually nothing like controlling the narrative. And you mm -hmm. often find that if you put forward an agenda, even if it gets tweaked, people are adding to 
um, your draft and um, effectively your client therefore is setting out the store to which others add or subtract and I think that tactically can be a huge advantage which we've now given away to everybody so <laughs> it won't be a secret <laughs> but um, anyway but um, I mean I think I don't know what what term um, Scarlett what you think about that Yes, I, I completely agree. And um, my general view is that if you're not taking the under the, the parapet approach that we talked about a minute ago, then you want to be the leader because mm -hmm. um, I think just getting in there early and making uh, a stance on whether it's an article to inquest and, and which who the IP should be and who should be called, it's all very, very helpful to set out your stall early. Yeah. And quite often, I think coroners appreciate it if, if they have submissions in, in, in good time, particularly if there are big issues. Um, like whether or not it ought to be an, an, an Article 2 inquest, where actually the, the, there is a fairly considerable amount of law involved. And I think it, it helps the, the coroner no end, not least because they have to provide rulings. Mm -hmm. And if what you've provided is a set of submissions or a skeleton argument, then frankly, I, I think they're always quite grateful if they can copy and paste the non-contentious bits. And it will, will always sets you in good stead at the outset. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think also there's that um, collaborative approach that often mm. um, that, that one has to adopt in an in, in inquest of, of um, everybody has to be sharing their information and their and their kind of it's not it's not it's not a forum where hiding your argument to the last minute is ever going to be tactically advantageous. But obviously, one of the things we've already touched upon is the difficulty that coroners face with resources in particular um, and with any kind of backroom infrastructure to enable them to run inquest. I do feel very sorry um, for lots of coroner's officers and cor coronial offices uh, because they really do struggle. And often what they struggle with is paperwork um, or even if it's an electronic bundling, but effectively documents and disclosure. Um, and really disclosure is very different in its organisation and management than in a, in a civil claim. Scarlett, can you just take us through that a little bit? Yes, yeah, so the specific provisions are, are on the slide. I'm not going to go through them verbatim, but broadly speaking, unlike in civil claims where the parties effectively swap their disclosure amongst themselves and the court get in, gets involved to set a different direction or, or to weigh in on, on disputes, the coronial system is slightly different. So parties will give their documents to the coroner. And again, the coroner's office will perform a sort of sifting exercise and send out what needs to be sent out to the other interested person. So not everything will be provided. It's a sort of coronial relevance uh, sift. And it's probably important to flag that you don't have to be an interested person to be asked for documents. So in civil proceedings, you would have to be a party. Um, uh, any party or person involved as a result of the coroner's investigations can be asked to, to provide documents. So this slide has, has some of those formal powers in the legislative provisions. We've then got another slide uh, over the page. Is it about, by magic? About onward disclosure. So as I said, it's, it's from the coroner to the interested persons. Now, my advice, strong advice, would be to really keep a log of what you've had from the coroner, what you're expecting and any requests that you've made, when they were made, uh, dates of follow-ups, et cetera, because we've alluded to the resource problems that the coroner's offices have. And in an ideal world, it would come out in a lovely bundle for all the IPs, everything that's going to be needed for the hearing. But in my experience, it's very often drip fed. Um, you can have things like policies which weren't in place at the relevant time, at the time of the death, you've really got to double check everything and do the legwork for the coroner if you want good quality disclosure. Yeah. Um, so expect lots of chasing. I think one of the things that's difficult as well is it often intersects. I mean, it's not just resources, but it intersects with that concept of how wide the scope is and how broad the investigation is going to be. Because if you're looking at the, the sort of narrow concept of how the deceased came by their death, um, then you could be looking at one hour or one minute or one day and the question and the suggestion of how far back disclosures go. So in a healthcare setting, you know, how long back of the period of treatment or um, of a time in a residential home or whatever it may be is going to be relevant is often a very difficult question and actually impossible to start answering until you've had a fair chunk of disclosure so I think it often goes through lots of different iterations as well and then you get that kind of Murphy's law of one side of a document is always the one that's copied and there are eight 
you know, there are eight copies of one document, and then the crucial one is missed out, etc. So um, I think that logistic point is 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 really true and is very much an ongoing issue. During the longer during the longer kinds of of, of inquest that we're, we're talking about, where there's a sort of chunk of investigation being done by everybody. And what's your view, Caroline? I think um, I mean. As, as, as you alluded to before, I, I, I do a lot of in inquests um, from deaths arising in a healthcare setting, and it can be a real problem because obviously medical records are, are, are very frequently voluminous, particularly if somebody has been receiving treatment over a very lengthy period of time. And about sort of 80 to 90 percent of the medical records are likely to be completely irrelevant. So if it is possible to, to have a degree of concord between, well, total concord, ideally, between the various interested persons and the coroner as to the point at which the medical records start to become relevant, I think that's very helpful, mm. not least because obtaining bundles and preparing bundles can be a real problem. And I think that if, if you are the person who's who, who has sort of ownership or control of the records, it really helps if prior to the inquest taking place, there is an agreed documents bundle um, if all of the parties have the documents in the same format with the same pages, then it simply helps the inquest to flow much more smoothly. And I think from the family's perspective, it allays any concerns that anybody is seeking to hide anything or bury anything or the coroner has one version and they don't. And, and, and really, that I think that's very upsetting for people at what is already a sort of difficult um, time. And, 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 and it simply means that, again, coronial resources are limited and if you are in a position to say look here is a documents bundle this is what we've got it's from these dates we've all agreed that these are the correct dates we're all working from the same pagination then not not only does it put you on a good footing but it actually means that the inquest can flow much more smoothly it's more likely to be effective and you're not mm. sidetracked by people saying I don't have that document we've got to adjourn for half an hour while we try and find a photocopier somewhere in that's you know Never good premises and try, or, or we try to email a document to yeah. somebody in a format that they can open because that's really never good for never anyone. Ideal. No, and particularly so as as inquests, not just the PIRs, but a lot of inquests are happening online. So you can't just get up and shove something across the room at someone either. Mm. Satisfactory as that may be, at least have it. I am conscious that time is galloping through, and we're not. Um, we've fallen into that trap yeah. of finding tons to say about everything. So I'm going to say that's really fascinating about disclosure. But if we ever want to get onto experts and tactics, we better crack on. So Scarlett, can you talk to us about um, that sort of intersection, as we say, often being in, involved in inquests for different potential purposes? Um, and one particular one is the stage at which this decision is made to you know, stop it being an inquest and, and convert it to a public inquiry. Yes, so this will often happen at the disclosure stage. And I always said we leave disclosure, so maybe I'll be quick. But um, typically this, this will happen where you have security sensitive material that's one of the main reasons um unless a politician sort of declares after an incident that, that some there should be a public inquiry then the conversion will typically happen on on disclosure grounds so um by statute disclosure of sensitive security material can only be made to a high court judge or above so not to a coroner so the, the question for the coroner is really, can I go ahead with my inquest and can I answer the the, the statutory questions without having a look at that material sometimes the answer is yes uh, but sometimes it's it's no and if the answer is no then then you can appoint a judge effectively in lieu of, of a coroner and a judge can can see that material but if it's so central so let's say um certain terrorist attacks and you're looking at awareness of of the intelligence services prior to the attacks then if the interested persons need to see that material, that broader disclosure, that's that's typically where you're going to have a conversion to a public inquiry because there's more flexibility in the proceedings to allow for closed hearings, special advocates, things that, that just aren't the norm in the coroner's court. So essentially, you can still ensure there's a full and fair scrutiny. It just essentially bumps up a grade and um, goes to the, goes to a judge in a public inquiry. So we know that a lot of that's set out on guidance sheet number thirty, and since um very important as it is, I suspect it's less part of the sort of daily grind. Um, I'm going to leave that there and say you need to know what you don't know or where to look it up um, and move back to something that's much more uh, commonly in, in a larger number of inquests, which is experts. So Caroline, experts is, is a really dense and complicated topic, um, but can you give us a, a canter through how and why experts are called in use in, in inquests? Critical issue is relevance and the extent to which an expert can assist the coroner in answering the four key questions. 
um, would really be the headline point. Um, the nature of the expert evidence, the scope of that evidence is a matter for the coroner. Um, part, um, interested persons may feel that it would help if they obtained their own expert evidence. Very often the experts will speak to a series of, of, of specific and discrete questions. Um, and ordinarily these questions, there'll be broad agreement um, between the interested persons as to what these questions ought to be. Um, if the expert is appointed by the coroner, then there will be the opportunity of pre-inquest review hearing and, and also subsequent in correspondence for the interested persons to provide to the coroner a list of the questions that they feel ought to be asked. But again, that's that's simply a matter for the coroner. Whereas you have a measure of control over what you ask your own expert, whether or not that is then adduced and forms part of the evidence at the inquest is, is, is once more a question for the coroner. And it's only challengeable on Wednesbury grounds. So in a way, um, one of the sort of key markers that's a kind of constant in, in the distinction between all civil claims and coronial court is that in the civil claim, the evidence and how the case is run is in the hands of the parties, mm. um, what evidence is called, um, what you put forward. And, you know, you may have to make an application to the court whether you're permitted to have expert evidence or whether it's relevant, etc. under the rules that we well know. But it's a flip in the co coroner's court because actually all of those decisions lie with the coroner and their inquisitorial position and the parties don't have the right to manage the evidence, do they? No. Um, I mean, if, if as an interested person, you think that the coroner has simply got it wrong when they've taken a decision um, not to instruct an expert um, for the benefit of the court, then, then it is open to you to obtain your own evidence, to put it before the coroner and to say, look, we've gone off, we, we've obtained this report and actually we feel it's really helpful in these particular respects. And the coroner may then say, well, actually, yes, I, I, I can see that, I accept that. And, and then that expert can be called and questions can be put to them. Um, so again, it isn't a sort of once and for all decision, but you are always at the coroner's, you know, at, in, at the mercy of the coroner and the exercise of the coroner's discretion. Um, and it's a wise, wide discretion, as I've said, and Wednesbury unreasonableness does set the bar high. Yeah. OK, so as we canter towards the halfway mark, let's look at when we don't have the coroner making all the decisions, but the instances when we have a jury, which really in the civil world is uh, the only time that we really handle do jury handling is in the coronial court. So, Scarlett, can you run through particular occasions when a, a, a coroner may rely on a jury? Yes. So the starting point is that there's, there's no jury. And the provisions of the 2009 Act are, are on the slide. It's, it's mandatory, effectively, where there's some form of, of state involvement. So, so custody, state detention, and it's a violent, unnatural death, uh, act of omission of the police. But also an important one not to forget is, is C, that the death was caused by a notifiable accident, poisoning, or disease. So often uh, people think about juries for state-related Article 2 deaths, but, but actually they're, they're very relevant for workplace accidents. Um, other than those mandatory provisions, the coroner also has a general discretion to hold an inquest with the jury uh, where he or she thinks there's sufficient reason to do so. In my experience, that tends to be, as I said, state involvement uh, issues that, that generally are seen to require some extra level of public scrutiny, having those up to 12 lay people there just to keep an eye on how things are, how the evidence is playing out. And so looking at that sort of public duty and that um, calling into question uh, the scrutiny of institutions, which is obviously a very important part of the coronial uh, remit, um, brings us neatly on to Article 2. Oops, I've gone two, sorry, I've done, skipped two. Um, and so perhaps you can sort of follow that through and, and, and help us about that engagement, um, um, what, what point it happens and why does it matter, Scarlett? Yes, yeah, so uh, the, a decision on Article 2 will typically be taken at the pre-inquest review hearing, the PIR. Um, it, that's a, not a, a once and for all decision, which is a bit of a theme in this talk, because uh, again, the, the, there's a funneling exercise with Article 2. So typically a, a decision will be made fairly early doors as to whether it's an Article 2 inquest, typically at the, at the PIR. But everybody can, can revisit that um, at the end of, of the evidence. So it's worth bearing in, that funneling exercise in mind, as well as your potential need to address the coroner twice. Don't sort of think, oh, I've done that. I don't, I don't need to think about it again. Um, so Article 2 is inquest, as many of our uh, listeners will know, is our inquest where the, the, the state's actions are called uh, into account. 
And there's a, there's a question mark over whether the state has had a role in a death. Um, it has the practical effect of really broadening um, an inquest scope and conclusions. Well, conclusions perhaps, because as we've said, there is that funneling exercise even in, in non-Article 2 inquests, because in an Article 2 inquest, you don't only just have to answer the four statutory questions that Caroline outlined for us earlier. There's then an additional question of in what circumstances the deceased came by his or her death, which captures quite quite a broad uh, array of factual backdrop. You also have uh, the case of Tainton on, on the slide, uh, so three bullets from, from the bottom, which told us that the, the question is whether conduct on the balance probabilities more than minimally, negligibly or trivially contributed to the death. So again, that's a relatively low bar. It doesn't have to be causative, potentially causative, probably causative, et cetera. We will return to, the issue of conclusions, we're not sort of there in our, our timeline yet, but just to flag at this stage that the article two has its big impact on conclusions. Typically, you're looking at a, a narrative conclusion to adequately capture the circumstances in which the deceased came by his or her death. And pivotally, article two means that the, the jury, uh, typically it will be a jury, can use fr judgmental phrases. So things like inappropriate, inadequate, failings, unsatisfactory, uh, and as we'll, we'll see later, that's not, not allowed normally in, in a non-Article 2 inquest. Okay, so we have the engagement of Article 2, and that will, um, that will affect the scope and investigation, and may or may not also feed through to the conclusion. Caroline, can you just give us a healthcare angle on the Article 2 issue? Of course. Um, I mean, the most, most obvious circumstance in which um, Article 2 is engaged is where somebody is detained under the Mental Health Act um, in, in, in a secure facility. Um, but there are considerable grey areas, particularly in the case of vulnerable adults um, who are under the care of the state. Um, voluntary inpatients would ordinarily be treated as an, in, in, in the same way as, as, as involuntary inpatients. Um, there are also, of course, outpatients, particularly with psychiatric facilities who, who subsequently either commit suicide or, or come to harm in some way. Um, very often, the coroner will find that Article 2 is engaged in those circumstances. Um, I have also seen submissions made in respect of Article 2 where you have, for example, somebody who attends a hospital or a general practitioner, and for some reason that they are particularly vulnerable, um, perhaps due to disability, perhaps due to some other temporary um, impairment, and consequently whether or not Article 2 is engaged in those circumstances is something with which they, the, the, the coroner has to engage. Um, the threshold remains very high in, in medical cases for, for findings that Article 2 is engaged, um, but the coroner, it's worth noting, may hear the inquest as an Article 2 compliant inquest if actually they're not sure at the outset, because the threshold for, for engagement of Article 2 is, is, is of course, simply suspicion mm. um, that, there may have, may, may, that, that Article 2 may potentially be engaged, and, and that's a significantly lower threshold. And, and as we've discussed, that may, of course, be why there's not a very considerable difference in, in, in the scope and the evidence heard throughout the inquest. And as Scarlett said, that decision can then be taken at the culmination of the evidence, and the coroner will say at that stage, actually, I do believe this is an Article 2 inquest, or, or, or I don't. And that, and that, of course, then frames the, um, the submissions that can be made and sure. the... And, and the conclusions that can be drawn. Okay, so that brings us nicely through our kind of funneling. So we've got our scope, and we're just going to move on to evidence. But just before we do, um, are juries always required for Article 2 cases? No. Okay. So once we've got um, our scope, and, and, and as you say, you've got your... Um, um, coroner looking at Article 2 or whatever, that brings us neatly into rules of evidence and hearsay, because once again, um, they're different from um, the civil court and, and, and they bring up their own particular issues and, and tactics. So the inquest is proceeding. Uh, and how do the rules of evidence and hearsay differ, Scarlett? Well, for starts, you don't have the, the civil procedure rules. You've got your, your coroner's 2013 rules, but there are only 34 of them, and they cover a lot more than, than just the evidence. So uh, you don't have that tight framework. Things are a lot more fluid and flexible. Uh, hearsay is permitted as, as it is in, in civil proceedings. But generally, the, the headline point, I think, for those who are, are, are keen to sort of practice more in the coronial courts is to know that everything typically tends to need to be 
put before the inquest. So in civil proceedings, you might have a, a witness statement that no one is going to attend court to speak to. Uh, we don't typically don't don't chief uh, people. We take their witness statement as their their evidence in chief. But the the coroner's court, the starting point is that we, all the evidence needs to be brought out. So. With statements from witnesses who aren't attending will, will be read out in, if typically in full and that's pursuant to rule 23 which is is on the screen and a coroner will take an individual sort of through their witness statement effectively as, as a chiefing exercise just to make sure that everything's heard at, before the court and that it doesn't matter whether there's there's a jury or not it's not it's not just for the jury it's generally how the the the, the court functions and so the court, the court, and um, the coroner will decide who they call. As you're saying, you can, you, if they've got a written statement and the person has been called, they'll read the whole thing out, or they'll lead them to get the evidence from them. Um, but if if the coroner is deciding that they're going to read something out, and um, um, you, as an interested party, may want to challenge that decision, um, that that's something that can happen, isn't it? What, what happens about that, Caroline? Um, you, you can make submissions to the coroner. You, you can say that you don't think that it's relevant. Um, you, you can say that you, you don't think it's it's reasonable for that evidence to be before the inquest for, for any other reason. But you, you, you have to accept ultimately that the, the decision is one for the coroner. Um, issues concerning hearsay evidence are, are particularly striking, I think, if you're used to practicing within the, um, the, the civil courts, <clears throat> because obviously then matters of weight um, weigh very heavily in the judge in, in, in the judge's mind and ordinarily hearsay evidence is afforded very little weight if it's admissible at all. Um, it is different in the coronial courts. The courts of course aren't bound by the strict rules of evidence and even documentary hearsay is permissible. But again the guideline word is 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 relevance. Um, the coroner will take it all into account and, and will attach to it such weight as as, as he or she thinks fit. Okay. Um, but I think it's it's important what Scarlett said about the way in which evidence is adduced, because, again, that's it's something that's quite surprising, I think, if, again, you're, you're used to a jurisdiction in which the witness statement stands yeah. and questions and, and, and essentially that, that, that there is no no evidence in chief. Um, the coroner will go through the witness statement very carefully um, with, with a witness or indeed may not refer to it at all, may simply ask for their sort of debate and account of what's taken place, mm. um, principally because the evidence that is being adduced is being adduced for the benefit of the wider public. So that, that, that and, and, and anybody who, who happens to be attending the inquest and, and specifically for, for the family. So it's not safe to, to think, well, it's all down there in the witness statement. A witness is, of course, permitted to refer to their witness statement to, to, to sort of jog their memory. But really, it's it's it, it's a process in which the coroner will very much take them through their in, their evidence and, and will ask such questions as as he or she thinks fit. Yeah. And that's sort of encapsulated on this slide. <coughs> well, and I think the only other thing I'd say is it is quite interesting when I mean, you often have the coroner will just sort of sit there and they'll have a long statement that's been taken and they'll say, Oh, you know, you say here that, um, I don't know, on that day you got up at, at this time and you went out here and you did this and the other and tell me what happened next, you know, really, really go through the, mm -hmm. um, go through a statement and, and have it all and if they're not have it read out on their behalf. Um, and so we've we've put up there as well a couple of um, the law sheet five, which is talking about that discretion of the coroner, um, and then that also um, impacts quite significantly on um, uh, when you're representing people on the advocacy style as well. Um, and so um, if we move on from the sort of coroner having led everyone through the evidence, what 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 impact does that have on the on the advocacy, Scarlett? So the guiding principle with, with advocacy in the inquest field is, is really to remember that these are inquisitorial proceedings, they're not adversarial proceedings, and the coroner really will not thank you for conducting your advocacy in a very adversarial style. So particularly sort of fairly hostile questioning of, of witnesses, because that's simply not the function of the forum. We're, we're all supposed to be there to find out what happened and, and to answer questions, not, not to lay blame, etc. So that's really important. Um, in September last year, the BSB, SRA and, and SILEX all issued guidance on the professional standards that lawyers must adhere to when conducting inquests. And that was largely produced because of concerns that the regulators had about how overly aggressive and hostile some inquests were, were increasingly being conducted. So 
uh, for any listeners, they, they, they have to go away and read those guidelines if they, they haven't already, because this could end up being a, a matter for your regulator. And like we said earlier, no, nobody wants that. But I think um, I think what's also difficult, though, is to marry that um, that sort of inquisitorial style is, is, is of necessity slightly sort of bloodless. It's a very kind of collaborative or kind of, you know, sherry um, with 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 often the need to dig quite deeply or quite hard into questions of conduct and procedure and um, particularly on behalf of bereaved families trying to find out what happened to their loved one um, uh, so it would be wrong to suggest that there's no um, um, rigor in that questioning but it's very much um, as you say a matter of style in terms of um, the closed questions and, and, and the sort of cross-examination style is very much um, frowned upon um, but it, it, again that all sort of feeds into how you handle your witnesses um, and you know what particular as you say we've got all the sheets telling you uh, the, 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 the the basic outlines of the rules but what about your tips and hints and your your, your tactics Caroline? Um, I would say make it very clear that what you are not looking is to attribute blame so if, if, if essentially what, what you want to do is to blame an individual, it's always a better line of questioning to look at the systems that are in place, to look at the rules that are in place, um, to look at whether or not this particular witness believes that this system was effective or, or that this rule was, you know, or, or that the system in, enabled this particular set of outcomes to be achieved. Depersonalize would, would be a critical point, I think. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that particularly if you're representing a family and, and, and feelings are, of course, heightened, um, that if you go for one witness to an extent that the coroner thinks is, 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 is improper in an inquisitorial process, that an important and valid line of questioning can be shut down. And whereas in court, you're used to a judge saying, well, where are you going with this? Or, you know, could you speed it up a bit? Or every now and again, somebody will jump up and say, no, that's that's not a proper question. Mm -hmm. um, by and large, really, you've got fairly free reign. Um, you, you are held within much tighter parameters within the coroner's court. And, and really, you, you just have to box clever. You have to think very carefully about what evidence it is that you want to get out, what questions you want to have answered, and an appropriate way in which you can approach those questions beforehand. And, 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 and you can sort of frame your questioning in such a way that it doesn't appear aggressive, it doesn't appear confrontational, it doesn't appear adversarial. And, 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 and that what you are intending to do is, is, is to elicit information. And that, of course, goes with, with, with whichever interested person you, 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 you're seeking to question. It's, it's fair to say that if, if you're representing a family, then the coroner is likely to give you significantly more leeway. Um, I think it's, it, it's pretty tasteless generally if, if you're asking critical questions of, of the family. And I think most, quest, most coroners would, would clamp down on that pretty swiftly, um, and, unless the circumstances were exceptional. Um, but nevertheless, I, I think you simply have to give very careful thought to the information that you're seeking to elicit and the questions that you want to have answered at the outset. And then you have to think about the best, the best way that you can sort of build cross examination, the best way that you can handle witnesses and which witnesses, which witnesses are going to be able to provide you with this evidence. Because if a witness says, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. And the yeah. is broadly speaking, generally minded to accept. And I, th I think, though, while um, coroners do tend to give families greater leeway and often mm -hmm. recognise it's the only forum they get to actually ask questions about what happened, um, I would say that that's the opposite of if the coroner decides that um, any particular advocate or any particular interested party is using their court to try and fish for info for a different forum, whether it's for making a claim mm. or a complaint or something else. And that, I think, gets, tends to get shut down much more quickly. You know, so uh, you can have quite a lot of leeway asking questions in the right in the right direction but if if the coroner suspects you're using it for a kind of um um for, for a sideways maneuver i think that gets mm. shut up pretty quickly i can see scarlet nodding away um ho hopefully you agree with me on that and but in terms of general tactics as well just keeping an eye on where are we getting to in our last 15 minutes um what about anything more broadly or um, uh, about tactics as, as well as just witness handling scarlet what do you think <laughs> 
I think it's important to, to read the room as we put it on the slide. It picks up on, on your previous point of, will the coroner think this is a, a sort of a sideways diversion or are you singing from the same hymn sheet in effect? And I think you need, you need to be ready to adjust your questioning and your submissions at a fairly last minute, bearing in mind the, the, the jury's concerns or the coroner's concerns. And there's a long list here for people to consider in, in slower time, but I, I picking up on the point we made earlier, I, I would say, go above and beyond to help the coroner if you if you can and your your client is happy for you to do that because you can really actively shape the role the inquest and and how it develops so submissions on whether it's article two you can offer specific witnesses to the coroner you don't need to wait for the coroner to identify someone you can say well actually that person doesn't know an awful lot about that policy you'd be better assisted by this person and you can even offer additional witnesses say well would you like to hear from someone who can address you on what we've done since uh, the death so mm. you can really offer things and 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 take quite a creative role in in how the inquest is shaped in a way that, that you can't in civil proceedings which are much more formulaic yeah, and of course, the outcome can be so much broader um, that that gives you some, some, as you say, some leeway. So really, I think in the last 15 minutes, we're going to focus on the end game, so to speak. So sort of potential conclusions, um, a lot of which is written out, um, and, and but we'll just pick out a few bits and pieces out of quite a lot of slides on that. And then the, and then the sort of the longer tales of the prevention of future deaths and what that might look like, and then sort of challenges um, two decisions and potential future claims. So here we have, don't please, um, you, hopefully you're on your pudding by now if you're having lunch while watching it, so don't choke on your choke on your crisps. Um, there are a few really dense slides because we want you to have this resource afterwards. I can take no credit for them, I have to say, um, but they brilliantly set out um, all the information you, you, you would need to know. Um, and in particular, there are some really good law sheets, um, um, as Caroline said right at the beginning about the um, the current your law sheets are really good law sheets on conclusions um, and, and what must be done. Galbraith Plus, um, never an easy bit of law. It always at this point perplexes me when inquests are meant to be something that um, your average punter can pick up and conduct. Um, Galbraith Plus has many a law student um, scratching their head. So, so I think that's a particularly tricky one. Um, but Caroline, do you want to just sort of canter through some of these bits and pieces of the potential conclusions um, for us um, uh, and pick out any highlights and headlines? Sure. Um, well, the next slide may be more relevant because I wanted to just sure. run through the record of inquest because yeah, quite often um, at, at, at an inquest, people will say, oh, well, you know, sort of box two, box three, box yeah. four, and all I think of what? what actually should go into each of these separate boxes. Um, box one's the name, so that's fairly straightforward. Um, box two is the medical cause of death, which is sometimes contentious, but more often not. Um, and that will generally have been dealt with um, within the post-mortem report, possibly toxicological evidence as well. But generally speaking, by, by the end of an inquest, that's, that, that's fairly clear. And there's normally um, agreement between interested persons and coroners what, what ought to go into box two. Um, Box three is, is the how, when and where. And what is, I think, more complicated about this is that the coroner will summarise the, the evidence, the factual evidence, and this doesn't form any part of the record of inquest. And the coroner, ordinarily speaking, will not do this in written format. They will simply um, do this orally. Um, a jury will much more commonly produce um, a, a sort of written um, factual that set of factual circumstances. Um, but but if, if, if it is only the coroner sitting, then what you will have is essentially a sort of factual account of the evidence that has taken place, a summary. And, and that, doesn't, that doesn't feature within the record of inquest. Um, box three, um, as I've referred to there, it's, it, it's very often very brief. Um, if, if the facts are relatively straightforward, um, then there'll be a summary of the findings of fact, and then there may be something, I've given various sort of examples there, um, trauma consistent with an unwitnessed fall downstairs, for example, or, or, or something of that nature. And then the conclusion must flow from box three, um, and the conclusion within box four will either be a short form conclusion, which is preferred, or a narrative conclusion. Um, unless it's article two, then that has to be um, short and neutral, um, there's very clear guidance to coroners that this, that this ought to be straightforward and brief. Um, if it's Article 2, then there may be, of course, because there is consideration of the circumstances, this may be more expansive. Box 3 and Box 4 are meant to be neutral 
if it's a non-Article 2 inquest. Um, if it's Article 2, then there can be judgmental findings of fact and, 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 and there can be conclusions of a judgmental nature. Um, I think it's all set out within the slides really there. I mean, this, these essentially are two quite sort of factual slides um, that, that take you through what is meant to go where and the, find, the conclusions that are open to the coroner that are open to the jury. Um, they have to be made on the balance of probabilities. It's the civil standard, even in the case of, of um, suicide or unlawful killing, which, which is an area with which Scarlett's more familiar. And that's something that I think has, given, has, has, has caused significant consternation um, particularly arising from deaths in the workplace. Yeah. Okay. So we'll come on to um, the unlawful killing, and I think I think the sort of wrap up in the box three is, um, as you say, that it, it's often an opportunity for a bit more information to be given, mm. um, even in a non-article two um, inquiry or or conclusion, um, and you get a bit more of the sort of meat that's there. But we'll pick up, I think, on just two specific conclusions to say a little bit more about neglect, which is often. Um, one that that we can we 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 um, dwell on, um, but also the one of unlawful killing, as you alluded to, um, Caroline. That's something, Scarlett, that you have um, engagement on. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so it's uh, it's more relevant to a broader array of of interested persons now because of the the change of law following the Supreme Court case of Morn in 2020. So that decided that the unlawful killing conclusions and suicide conclusions, as Caroline said, are decided on the civil standard of proof, the balance of probabilities, rather than on the old criminal standard beyond a reasonable doubt. So um, particularly in, in the workplace, there are an array of offences that, that now become increasingly relevant in the inquest sphere. And it's, it's worth bearing in mind that an inquest is most likely to come after any criminal proceedings have taken place. The it's worth visiting the schedule that we've set out on the slides because the, the, the provisions are fairly nuanced. But speaking generally, let's say that a, a criminal trial has, has taken place. There is a discretion for the coroner to, to nonetheless hold an inquest. And of course, you can make submissions on behalf of your client on that issue. But those listening might be thinking, well, well why is there a need for an inquest following a, a criminal trial? Well, the answer is, is that inquests can, can be broader. So particularly in an Article 2 inquest, there are, I've had some inquests where the criminal proceedings have focused almost exclusively on the acts of, of the, the, the assailant or the defendant. And it, the inquest has then been a, a question of, well, in what circumstances did this unfold mm. and who was aware of these risks and, and how did they come to pass given what was known? So there, there, there can be merit in an inquest after criminal proceedings and that's certainly something to, to, to bear in mind and, and you may want to address the coroner on that. And that can be much more of a driver for change as well if you look at the sort of institution or, 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 or the framework that led to this situation occurring and, and in particular the duty to look at prevention of future death which I do want to have enough time to, to kind of come on to. Um, so that's really helpful. I think we just touch very quickly if we may Caroline on um, neglect because that's another sort of key conclusion that often parties um, or interested persons rather, are seeking to either have or avoid. Um, so if we have a couple of minutes on that, and then we should have enough time just to have a quick canter through uh, what happens after the process is ended. Sure. I mean, I, I think the critical issue with neglect is, firstly, it's not a conclusion in its own right. It's a rider to a, to a, a different conclusion, either a narrative or short form. Um, and I think it's very different to negligence. Um, neglect as a conclusion or rider to um, is, is, is pretty niche, actually. You have firstly to have somebody in, the, in a dependent position. That's usually not terribly controversial. Um, there has to be a gross failure, and I'm looking at this specifically in this healthcare perspective, um, to provide adequate nourishment or liquid is, is, is one thing, but usually it's basic medical attention um, that, that comes to the fore. Um, it's worth stressing that it has to be a lack of medical attention that's provided rather than looking at whether or not there was um, negligent or inappropriate treatment, and it has to be basic medical attention. Um, what the coroners are very much not concerned with are complex medical decisions um, or inadequate decision making, but where treatment is, 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 is ongoing. That's something that sounds within the field of, of clinical negligence, but very much not within neglect. For neglect, you're looking more at cases, uh, at matters such as 
carrying out blood tests, for example, or interpreting straightforward tests or a, a failure to carry out any appropriate treatment at all when it's perfectly apparent that somebody requires that treatment. Um, if, if what you have done is you have assessed somebody and, and you have determined, for example, that they have capacity and, and, and therefore you cannot sort of force treatment upon them, um, that that is, is not a generally speaking, a matter for basic medical attention. If you're looking at different treatment pathways, that ordinarily would well and truly take a matter out, out of the scope of neglect. Um, again, that there must be a direct um, causal connection between the failure and the cause of death as well. So you can have failed to provide treatment, but unless it was specifically that failure that caused the death, um, again, neglect is, 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 is not open either to a coroner or, or to a jury. Yeah, I think causation is something that um, often is, 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 is slightly forgotten. Um, there is much to be said. We could do an entire talk on neglect. Mm. Um, but I think if we leave it there, um, save, I would say there's a really, really good outline of the, the rules and, and the principles of neglect in the law sheet, looking at verdicts or conclusions. Um, and also, I mean, although it's a 95 case, Jameson remains the kind of watchword in terms of having a set out towards the end of the judgment, set out paragraphs, really going through all the elements that you need. Um, but having gone through the conclusions, the other requirement, which we've touched on a couple of times, is that the coroner has a freestanding requirement, an obligation to look at issues that may prevent future death, which um, was one of the cornerstones of the sort of revamping of the coronial court and making it sort of relevant for um, mod modern day sort of fit for purpose investigation. And this is a very wide power, isn't it, Scarlett? It is. So you can see the text of the legislation on the screen and it allows, well, it, in fact, it obliges coroners to make reports where their investigation has revealed anything which give rise to a concern that there are there's a risk of, of other deaths occurring uh, in the future. And so that the, the concern that the, the coroner has doesn't need to be connected to the, the death of the deceased and how that unfolded. It's generally a, a free for all, as it were, in terms of what, what the coroner has seen and if he or she has any concerns. If they have those concerns, as I say, they're obliged to, to make a PFD report and to send it to an individual who is able to, to take power to negate that risk going forward. And that, the that sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say that person or, or body has an obligation to, to respond. Right. So it's because the coroner has to identify a body or person or, 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 or inst institution or institute that it can, that the coroner can communicate with and demand, um, demand a response from. But Caroline, how closely connected to the subject matter of the inquest um, does this duty have to be? Um, it does. There doesn't have to be a causal connection. So if, if, if a matter for concern has, has arisen within the context of an inquest, um, it doesn't have to be something that has caused or contributed to the death. It simply has to be something um, concerning which the coroner has concerns that, 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 you know, that, that there may be a risk if those circumstances continue um, of, of there being deaths in the future. Um, it can be difficult uh, identifying the correct body to direct the, the PFD towards. So if, for example, a, a death has taken place in a healthcare setting and actually the trust has investigated this very carefully, um, they've prepared a good quality um, serious incident report that there's a good action plan um, in place, most measures have been undertaken. And actually the coroner is persuaded that that risk is not going to arise within the context of that particular setting again. Um, the family do sometimes say, well, actually we, we still think that there is a broader risk. Right. Um, and, and, and we think that these problems could arise in other trusts or that actually if you just sort of amend the circumstances slightly that there is a risk of this particular thing happening again. And in those circumstances, of course, the coroner can widen um, consideration to whether or not this is something that ought to be directed to a regulatory body that, what, what, for, for example, in the, in, in the case of deaths in care homes, if it's a problem that the family has, has managed to persuade the coroner is, is, is happening across a range of homes, um, there may be need to refer to the CQC, for example. OK, so we're into our last yeah, minute. Yeah, so I'm going to um, I'm going to say, right, that let's let's move on. Um, but it's also just worth pointing out that they are all published. You can look on mm. the um, coronial website and it's actually really fascinating sometimes to see 
both what's been published and also uh, what the response has been. And if you've got an inquest that is involved, like for example, you often have, that well not often, but there, there could be tranches of, um, a, a, of a sudden flurry of, of, of suicides using a particular method. And then you can see there's already been a report for a prevention of future death or so on and so forth. And they're very interesting just to look at. Um, but the last few minutes, let's just have a little quick crack on what else one can do and challenges to the coronial decision. So you've got through this entire process. Um, but you are a little underwhelmed or far from thrilled with what your coroner has done. Um, so Scarlett, what are your options if you've got a decision that you um, disagree with? Well, they're limited. There's no appeal route like we have in, in the, the civil courts, but it is possible to judicially review any decision of the coroner, so not just their conclusion, any, any of their sort of case management decisions leading up to the inquest itself. Um, the usual public law grounds will apply. I think Caroline said earlier that, that, mm. that Wensbury unreasonableness is a high bar. Of course it is. Um, but there's also a specific statutory provision, Section 13 of the Coroner's Act 88, which allows a party to apply to the High Court, um, either asking that an inquest be held if a coroner has said, oh, no, we don't need one, or to order a, a fresh inquest where that's necessary or desirable in the interests of justice. And the, the, the broader text is from the statutes on the slide. So there's there's a bit of an overlap between those two sources of, of review, and it's it's for any party really to to think long and hard about what the, the best tactic is. Um, bearing in mind, of course, the the tight time, time scales you have for limitation in, in judicial review proceedings. And of course, that's only, as you say, going to end up in quashing the inquest or the determination that's made at the inquest. So at best, you might have the whole thing happening again, and it doesn't take you much further. But you may also be wanting to consider a future claim um, and look at what else you can do in another forum. So finally, uh, you've got the information. And Caroline, what are, what are some factors or tactics we can provide um, people to think about when bearing in mind looking at a future claim? Um, from if, if you're representing a family, then it's an opportunity to obtain essentially some pre action disclosure. There's, the, there's a dress rehearsal element to the cross-examination. Um, quite often, particular facts will be elicited um, that are potentially helpful with a view to civil proceedings, although, of course, that's not, not the aim of the inquest. Um, if you're an interested person, then I think it can be helpful because you, you do get to see how your witnesses um, perform when they're questioned. It, it gives you the opportunity to sort of sharpen up your own evidence, to give real thought, actually, to... to I mean, I'm, I'm going to say your case, although that, of course, is not what it is at the coroner's court, but, but it does give you the opportunity to do that. And actually, so, often you've got that room to just put in a sort of letter of claim, so to speak, or just have a negotiation because actually quite a lot of evidence has been exchanged and heard. So you may yeah. actually preempt the entire claim process. OK, I'm conscious of the fact that we're now running over. So really, I think we're just going to sort of leave it here. There's potentially Human Rights Act claims as well. Um, but uh, but using all of those things to move things forward in the usual way. And finally, Caroline, about 10 seconds on costs and funding, but it is often a contentious matter for inquests, isn't it? It is, yes, um, particularly for families, of course. Uh, there is legal aid fund, it's, it's not generally available, is, is the starting point. Um, if you think that you may have a decent civil claim in the long run, then um, there are a lot of firms of solicitors who are prepared to act under a um, no win, no fee agreement, and the costs can subsequently, or at least some part of the costs, can subsequently be recovered through civil proceedings. Um, there are that there is funding available um, exceptionally in Article 2 cases. It, it isn't means tested, but it is merits tested. So you have to demonstrate um, that it's, a, it's an exceptional case in, in, in effect um, due, mm. due to the circumstances. Um, potential risk of human rights breach if it's not granted, and um, that's under Article 2, and the wider public interest um, can also be a, a further ground on which funding can be sought and may be granted. Okay. Um, and it, it's all set out within the slide, really, and there's, there's, there's not a great deal to add to that, but ultimately it's an unsatisfactory position, and a lot of families are very frustrated by it. Yeah. And, and a lot of funding important. isn't provided, a lot of people aren't represented, but... Mm -hmm. um, I think what you're saying in the in the in the civil sphere is there's often an option to get those coroner costs back in the um, civil claim. But one word of warning: if you've got an unqualified admission of liability at a very early stage, yes, um, then then it, it can be a real challenge to get back that 
um, cost of representation, but often that's often the only time the family have to ask what happened, um, because an admission of liability is a fairly blunt tool and you don't really go behind that. But I think we'll just leave it there. Um, thank to everybody for taking part and to Scarlett and Caroline for taking us through really interestingly a lot of the um, issues um, and hopefully we will put up the slides and a link to this talk for you to ruminate on um, if you should wish or to share with your colleagues and um, there are also a couple of questions that we haven't really got time to look at now but we will also answer those for you um, and, and, and put all of that up on our website so do come back and have a little look and browse through we have lots of resources on this and other perhaps matters of interest. Thank you ever so much for your um, kind um, attendance today. And um, I hope some of you are still with us. Um, thanks very much for listening and we hope you have enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.